So, okay. let's look at breeding. We'll just go a little bit further. So how do these guys breed? They breed like other echinoderms. The, uh, remember we talked about the hydropore, that little uh, opening that sucks water in. A lot of times that's called the hydropore slash gonopore. Many of and I pronounce it, but that's where the little sexual products come out. And they are, as far as we know, the arrows would be sexed just like crinoids have males and females and so on. So they're spewing their little sexual things up in the water whenever they decide that there's the right time. Currents are flowing around, mixing them, you get a little fertilized the eggs and their larvae, their, their planktonics that are floating around. And uh, these uh, actually are pictures of actual larvae. <laughs> Some of you are probably wondering that, but they're not. <laughs> this actually might be what they looked like, or similar to this. These are uh, larvae from modern stock crinoids. A lot of echinoderms have similar larvae, from what I understand. Um, these are very small, little scale large, 100 microns. Um, these, uh, the Kano and a whole bunch of other folks got together, and they actually were able to get modern stocked primates to spawn, if you will, in the lab and uh, contract the development. Uh, this is uh, a portion of that. <coughs> this takes a number of days. And up here, uh, you see some little kind of little curvy lines on some of these. There's actually little cilia on there. So they have the cilia go on and it can help them move a little bit. When it gets to this stage, the, the, the caption that goes with this says that there's an adhesive pit on the bottom. So again, this is a stock crinoid, so you know, that's probably the time he's going to start settling and sticking on something. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the Egrios had some similar scheme, very tiny little larva. They had some amount of mobility to move around the current are doing their thing. But then <clears throat> it's time. You know, however many days pass, we don't know, they're going to settle. So we want to know what are they going to settle on. They're going to look for Raphnaschina, right? We'll see. Here's another sideline. They gave me this new little bit of information uh, when he was out. Uh, this is a, a modern brachypod, which I stole off your poster. Uh, the, you know, this, this red filament stuff, that's the local floor. That's the thing, how, these, how they filter feed. You can see how wide this shell is open here on this, this bracket pod. Here is a artistic mock-up <laughs> of a wrap the skin open at 90 degrees. It's something that uh, Dave said Ben Dottillo has determined mechanically that the valve uh, hinges would allow. So it would physically allow it to be 90, maybe 90, maybe 185. I don't know. But it's going to be pretty wide open. And if you're a larva, floating around in the water and you're looking for graph mosquito. You're looking down. This is what you're seeing on that open valve. If you're seeing this, this is the area where that rope core would be. That means you're lunch. If you're a larva and you end up in there. But my God, look at that. That's that rim that they like. That's what they see most if that thing is open. That's pretty interesting, I think. So, I'd like to say I got this drawing from somebody else, but this is my uh, concept drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and here we have examples from our, our actual place. We've got Arizona, uh, I believe the larva settled on a nice career dense clam. Here's one that settled on the on hard matrix. Here's one on a, a closed, or is it a dead, rapid skin shell. Here's one on top of a little bryzoa that's growing on a shell. Here's a couple on a Ramos bryzoa. And here's two sitting up on that rim they really like. Well, here's two guys got eaten, and that guy ended up in the mud. So the red guys are dead. <laughs> okay? So invertebrates, uh, they put out a lot of little babies, so that some of them survive. Mm -hmm. So it uh, doesn't matter if they lose a few, as long as some make it. So now, if we assume the Edrios larva had a high degree of mobility, which is one, one possibility, <laughs> Let's say they, they land on something, they say, whoa, this is not going to do. And I'm hungry, I'm going to hunt for something else. So they use their little silly and they float around a little bit more and they, they try to find an ideal spot. So they're going to strive to find that wrap the skin. That's one possibility. And they, if they do that, they'll become a fossil, ideally. Now, what if they weren't? Well, if they weren't, if they don't land on something good, they're going to die, and no fossil. So we have two things here saying that uh, since these embryos were able to survive,
five of all these different substrates we found that all of them must have been suitable, either because they moved there or because they landed there, one way or the other. So the, the amount of mobility is, is kind of irrelevant to this idea. So also, again, my, my criteria here is once they were stuck there, that's where they were stuck, in essence. So this is my little hypothesis. They were opportunistic. They weren't seeking out rapid scheme. The previous associations that have come up where they were on Raffinoskina and they were on the commissure, they, were, they had settled on a, a bracket pod that was open and feeding. So they're on the rim. Because that's what they, that's right there. Uh, the ones that are more centrally located landed there initially. And they were either on a dead valve or a live one. They just happened to be sleeping at the time, we'll say. I don't know. He was closed. And then the last part there is there, uh, we had some, uh, talk before that the uh, Hedros and the rafts, you know, were association, that they were, uh, that's what they wanted to be on, the Raff Esquina. And my contention is that those sites were probably heavily populated by Raff Esquina and lightly populated by other suitable colonizing sites, clams, which weren't as abundant. And uh, some of this just popped to me the other day, uh, I was looking at my specimens the other day for this, uh, this new work. I don't really think they're hunting down Raff Esquina. I don't think they can. And I, I believe this, in my mind, this believes why they're on the rim. Because you got a bunch of live rabbit mosquito and they're open and feeding when these guys settle. So, there's always a problem. <laughs> this is one of the problems we don't yet have an answer for. This, uh, this is a whole rabbit mosquito, low valves there, you know, presumably alive when buried. This side here was down on a slab at the site when we found it. Underneath it was just mud. And it was loose. It just pop, popped off the slab because it was just mud. Cleaned up the mud and wow, really nice strep duster. Well, he couldn't have lived in the mud. And the other intriguing thing is, on the other side, here's a little isorophus. He's on the other side of the shell. The only way these two could live together, be alive at the same time, is for the shell to have this side up. The conventional wisdom is that side was down. And from a hydrodynamic standpoint, that side being down is stable, more stable than putting that side up. So this has always been a, an issue with uh, which way do these things live? But you know, if you look at the slabs up here and the stuff that we examine, what you're finding is they're down. This side is down. But how to explain that is uh, going to be an interesting thing. And this, of course, being a larger specimen, has been there longer. Maybe this guy somehow got flipped and he was living like this for a while when the, when the strep duster colonized that. Maybe. I don't know. We don't have, I don't really have an answer for that. I'm sure Dave will come up with something. Yeah. <laughs> this was another problem, which may be less of a problem now, after reading some other, other work. Um, this is a double. This is a, an isorophus right on top of what I believe is a cardiola, out in the middle of the matrix. And I thought, I thought this could, one, this is one of the things that at that time they convinced me that, well, they had to move. Somehow this guy moved or he was loose or getting ready to move when a, this curve came around and blew him over on top of this other e -grail. But again, our friend Colin has done some studies and found people were asked what's living on other living organisms, including rhomiferum cystoids, other echinoids, <coughs> and they're known to, to colonize crinoid stems. So it's not totally out of the realm of possibility that this guy landed on another Pedro and is growing there. Now eventually it's, it's going to be a significant problem for this one under here because the speeding apparatus is getting restricted. If that is exactly what's going on, if this is a living association. So that's, that's another intriguing thing. And since this is uh, Darwin's birthday, I'll leave you with Charles. <laughs> and uh, thanks for some of the people I stole uh, pictures from. So that's, that's what I got. All right.